Good afternoon, everyone. As Steve said, I'm going to talk about some work that has been going on at uh, the Lake Trout uh, Positional Telemetry Array uh, at Drummond Island in Lake Huron. So, as most people associated with, uh, a lot of people know that uh, the GLaDOS folks have taken to calling Chuck Kruger Yoda because of his great wisdom in all this telemetry stuff, you know, and, and so there's, there's a lot of people involved in this work and, and Chuck, being the humble person that he is, always wants his name to be last on all these lists, but there's, as I say, there's a lot of people that have contributed to this, and, but most people recognize that none of this stuff would be happening without the leadership and vision of Chuck Kruger. So as most people know as well, we've seen recent natural reproduction of lake trout in Lake Huron. Um, uh, the USGS trawl survey picked, started picking up a lot of uh, juvenile, primarily fry, lake trout fry, around 2004. And the majority of these fish were captured near Drummond Island. And now we're seeing high catch rates of wild fish in uh, lake trout fisheries. So we thought if we were going to study lake trout reproduction, we won't probably want to do it near Drummond Island because we're seeing all these uh, wild fish around there. This is a picture taken by Tom Binder in 2011. And if you look really closely, you can see adipose fins on some of these fish. These are wild lake trout staging to spawn at Drummond Island. So the purpose of the work there originally was to describe and compare the spawning behaviors of wild and hatchery lake trout. It's the work started in 2010, and I believe the last year is the last year the array is going to be, and it may go in for one more year. Um, the money that supported this research is from the GLRI. And one thing we've learned uh, from this right off the bat is that you get a lot of data from this stuff, and you've heard this before this week. Um, this is a full-time job for somebody just to manage the data. You know, it's ridiculous how much stuff we get. So this is the Drummond Island. This is a Drummond Island refuge up here, and. Uh, that's where the array went. So uh, the overview of this, I'm going to talk about five different things. This is kind of a dog's breakfast of stuff because it's just the stuff that we've managed to get make some progress on so far. Um, a lot of the, one of the problems with this, some of this data is that you uh, have to wait. You know, and there's more data always coming. You know, the arrays in the water, and you, it's hard to decide when to cut it off and say, okay, now we're done. We're going to study this. But the things we've got some data on so far are, are now our spawning behavior, spawning habitat. We tried some remote sensing of spawning habitat. We've got good data on site fidelity, and then there's some data on long distance movements I'll go through. So first of all, this is the array in one year. So it varied slightly from year to year, but this was the, the largest acoustic, positional acoustic telemetry array ever deployed anywhere. So it's about say, 20 to 25 square kilometers. And I gotta say that Tom Binder and his crews at, at Hammond Bay deserve an enormous amount of credit for keeping this thing in the water every year and getting it out. It's just an enormous amount of work to, uh, to deploy this thing. And uh, it's often in bad weather conditions. So this is the array coming out last year. And this may be one of the reasons we don't know much about lake trout spawning is because <laughs> these are the conditions you have to work in to study it. Uh, so the first thing I'm talking about is spawning behavior. So as well as the array, we also had some cameras out there underwater cameras, and uh, we believe we've identified a new spawning behavior in, in lake trout. So the, the standard model of spawning behavior, is, uh, these behaviors called traveling, where the fish travel around the reef near the, near the substrate in groups, and then sinking, where the fish sink to the substrate, and then gamete release here, where they actually spawn. But from our cameras, we found a new, a new uh, behavior that we call hovering up here. And this occurs prior to spawning, so prior to when the fish actually hit the substrate and start traveling. And uh, the female sits at, at horizontally, and, and males, one or two or three males, will, will orient themselves at this strange angle to the female. And we believe this, some, this is part of courtship. So as I said, these are the first, the first direct observations of spawning in the Great Lakes, probably because the fish spawn at night in the fall when the weather's awful, and people have had very few opportunities to see them. So uh, this was published just this year, and uh, this is a photograph of of these fish doing this. And you see this quite a bit off, off the edge of the reef. So this is new information and uh, it may help us understand uh, courtship in lake trout much better. The second thing I'm going to talk about is the habitat. So as part of the project, we commissioned Nigel Watrous at the University of Minnesota to conduct this fine scale bathymetry. This is similar to what Jay Glaze was showing this morning, if anyone was here for that. Uh, it's a multi-beam sonar um, 
bathymetry. And this is a, a particular area within the array near Drummond Island. So this is Drummond Island here. Uh, it's called Horseshoe Reef, and this is where people have been observing uh, reproduction for a long time. Um, fishermen have, have noted this as a, as, a, as a spawning area for decades. And so this is where we partially located the reef here, so uh, the array here, so we could look at the behaviors on this reef. Now you see the, the bathymetry here is something like what Jay was showing earlier again too. It's a series of ridges that run north-south off the island. And uh, so I looked at this a couple times, the first few meetings we had on this stuff, and I was saying, what are those ridges? You know, and, and, I, and I was saying, they look like drumlins to me. Um, and so you can see the fish. We have these, these are uh, observations within the array of positions of lake trout. And this is Horseshoe Reef again here. Um, you can see the fish running up and down these ridges a lot. They spend a lot of time on these ridges. And a lot of the spawning occurs there right at Drummond Island on these ridges. And so after looking into it further, we, we discovered that lake trout spawn on these drumlins. Now, drumlins are glacial features that are formed by receding glaciers. So when the glacier advances, you can sort of imagine it like an, an obstacle in a river where the ice is flowing over, it hits a boulder or, or a bedrock outcropping, and the substrate will get deposited behind it. So the substrate that's being carried in the ice will get dumped behind this boulder, and then the glacier recedes slightly and then advances. So it goes over top of these things several times. And we end up with, end up with uh, these layers of substrate within these, these drumlins. And these things are like small hills. We see them on land. They look like small hills. And actually, if people familiar with this northern Lake Huron area who know the Lake Chino Islands, well, the Lake Chino Islands themselves are drumlins. Um, so these, we, we connected with a, a guy from University, Brock University in uh, Ontario called John Menzies, who's, a, who's the world expert on drumlins. And he was able to take our bathymetry and line, show these, the, the long axes of these drumlins here in the red. Um, and you note that these are, these are spawning areas where he found lake trout spawning and actually found eggs in the substrate. And they're all associated, with one exception, uh, directly or right next to these drumlins. This makes a lot of sense because Lake trout are the only salmonids that doesn't spawn in rivers. Now, river spawning salmonids uh, take advantage of the flow of the river, which sorts the gravel and cleans it. But in this case, the, 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 the glaciers here will have sorted these large substrate particles into these drumlins, and this is the perfect sort of habitat for lake trout to spawn on. And uh, as you see here, this is a, a redrawn <coughs> image from a paper from the 80s that shows this area, this whole area is surrounded, is full of drumlins here. And you can see they I don't know how they got this information back then, but you see some of them stick out in the water, and there's the Lake Chinos there. Um, but you can't detect these things underwater with the current bathymetry. Uh, you need to have this fine scale bathymetry. They, they can be detected on land, of course, you can go measure them and, and mess with them. But uh, so they're all over this area. In fact, some of those images that Jay showed of the spawning areas near the, the Apostle Isles, I believe from looking at those images today, are drumlins too. And there's a lot of drumlins in that area too. So it, this, this uh, discovery here may help us sort of have a new framework to understand lake trout spawning habitat. They tend to associate with these glacial bed forms. The other thing here you see are eskers. We didn't find any up here, but on the land here is eskers, and the eskers are actually uh, glacial river valleys. So this is where a river flowed either underneath or over top of the glacier, and when the glacier melted away, it just dumped that riverbed right on the ground. And so we think that those features as well might be important for uh, spawning of lake trout and maybe other species as well. So the next thing here is that, uh, you know, it's, it's a strange thing, but uh, female lake trout, when you, when you watch these movies we have, when you, when you look in the literature, they're not known to clean the substrate. So female uh, salmonids that spawn in rivers will, will turn on their side and use their tail to dig in the substrate and dig their nest up. Well, female lake trout don't do that. We very, occasionally you see a fish go by and sort of flutter a little bit, maybe it's a vestigial behavior, but you don't see them doing these sustained digging but when they're done spawning, Tom Viner observed that the, the substrate looks cleaner, as if they had dug it. So it's kind of a paradox, but um, it, we think maybe it's just perhaps the, the action of a whole bunch of fish just continually swimming over the reef may sort of clean the substrate. But we were thinking, well, maybe you can tell the difference between an area where a fish spawned and didn't spawn by looking at the, where the substrate's clean. And so we hooked up with the people from the Michigan Tech Research Institute here, here in Ann Arbor here, and we got satellite imagery. So in 2013, we got, this is a satellite here, it's a European uh, military slash civilian satellite that you can, you can direct it to take pictures um, on good days. Um, and so we had an image taken in September and in November two, uh, 2013. And um, 
the guys at MTRI have developed this technique to, to look at changes in substrate uh, color. So, I mean, they can see, and here's Horseshoe Reef again, right here, and here. So they can take these images and, and they manipulate the color bands and they can sort of look at changes over time in the substrate. And it seems that, uh, oops. Uh, so we have these images and this, this shows where the substrate got cleaner between September and November. And this is a close-up here of Horseshoe Reef and this other area where we saw spawning. And these yellow dots are where we saw eggs. We actually collected eggs. So this model, without the exception of this point here, and a couple points here, appears to be doing pretty good at, at um, identifying areas where we know trout spawn. We're, we're still working on this, but the model we developed shows us about 80 or 90 percent accurate at identifying an area. So we think this could be useful for areas where we don't know exactly where lake trout spawn. You could get these images and maybe find places you want to narrow in on and, and look for lake trout spawning habitat. Next thing, Chuck talked about this a little bit yesterday in his talk, but so this is the, at the, the fish that spawned in the array. We looked at, at how often they came back um, to the site and uh, the results show that it's but, you know, somewhere between 80 and 90% average site fidelity for these fish, but the data show that there's a, an effect, the hatchery, the hatchery females, wild females, hatchery males, wild males, it seems like the wild fish have a slightly better site fidelity than the hatchery fish. This is something that's interesting. But I don't think we expected the site fidelity to be so high. Um, and then I want to point out that uh, these are very, very good estimates of site fidelity. It's probably the best that exists for lake trout anywhere and perhaps for any salmonid because this uses the Cormac Jolly Seaver maximum likelihood sort of program mark um, analysis. and. Um, so we have a complete capture history for every fish. In the old days when you estimated site fidelity, you might tag some fish and then put gill nets out and see how many, what proportion of those fish came back. But you don't know what ones came back that you couldn't, didn't catch. In this case, we know exactly if a fish came back to this reef, we know it was there. And so, uh, as I say, this, is, this data, or these rates of site failure are higher than I would have expected anyway. And there's some evidence that the hatchery fish aren't as good as co at coming back. So whether they just don't come back at all or they, or they don't spawn at all or they go somewhere else, we don't know. But we know they're less likely to come back to the same spot. Now I'm going to talk real quick about this stuff. There's a bunch of stuff here. I'm going to go pretty quick through it. Um, you're all aware that the, these are locations of, oh, damn it. These are locations of uh, receiver arrays around the Great Lakes. Um, so we have the fish up here at Drummond Island, but they're also detected at a bunch of arrays around the lake. Uh, first, I'm going to show you data from the fishery recapture. So this is the normal way you would have done this sort of movement stuff in the past. How far did they move? You tag them at one point, you release them, and then you catch them somewhere else, but you only catch them once because they're you know, fishery and they're dead. So uh, this is the location of our recaptures. Uh, the, the, the red dots are where the fish, was, fish were released off Drummond Island. The black dots are recaptures, and the, the blue triangles are recaptures within what we think of as the spawning season from the middle of October to the end of November. So we're thinking that the recaptures of fish in these areas may indicate that there's spawning habitat in some of these areas here. This is the kind of thing you would normally see, and this, is the, this was pre previously, before the advent of this technology, the only way to estimate movement. So this data, and I gotta also say that these um, recaptures are obviously affected by where the fisheries occur, you know, so I mean you can't catch fish where there's no fishery. So most of the fishing goes on on the Canadian side and that's why most of our fish appear to have been captured on the Canadian side. Um, so these fish obviously don't respect international boundaries. And the, so we, this data suggests that the fish move on, on you know, average of around 50 kilometers. And this is well in line with all the other previous studies, right, sort of in the middle of the range of these estimates of, of the mean distance moved by, by lake trout. Now again, <coughs> we're, we can look at now, look at this question in a different light because we have all this new technology. Uh, the one problem is though this, this array, the, the way the arrays are arranged around the lake is not ideal for lake trout because lake trout like to spend a lot of time in deep water. And you can see this line here, it's the, 50, the 25 meter iso bath around the lake. So a lot of these receivers are located outside in shallower water than, than uh, lake trout like to occupy. Lake trout generally tend to stay fairly deep in cold water. Um, and so we're probably pretty unlikely to, to see, uh, to detect a lot of lake trout moving around. Also, there's very poor coverage in some areas of the lake. The Canadian side has, has nothing here, nothing in 
George Bay, nothing in the door channel. Um, so we really only make inference about fish moving a lot down the Michigan side. And the timing is too, the, some of these receivers are only in for a very short period. They're not all, they haven't all been operating continuously and some of them are, have been out for quite a while. So I'm gonna do, um, you know, first I'm gonna show you this. This shows you the, the, the number of fish that were detected from our Drummond Island uh, samples at these different receivers. And you see the majority of them were just detected right near Drummond Island. This is detour channel on one side of Drummond Island and then the false detour channel on the other side. And then this is the ray itself in the middle. So most of the fish were just detected um, in those areas, but there are several instances of fish moving up and down the Michigan coast. And when you want to try and look at this, you, you want to try and classify these fish in, in, into groups and uh, try to understand you know, what, how, what proportion of the population is doing this kind of movement pattern and that. It's very difficult uh, with the receiver placement. But we can look at the difference between uh, fish that spawned at the array up here and fish that didn't spawn at the array. So the fish that did spawn at the array, we never saw about 10% of them ever again. After they were at the array, we didn't detect them anywhere else. So they may have gone in, into the Canadian waters over in Georgia Bay or something. Uh, about 70% um, of the fish that spawned, we saw only at those two arrays, at, right near the, 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 uh, the flip positional array. And then about 22% we saw moving up and down the Michigan coast. But for fish that didn't spawn at the array, we didn't see half of them ever again. They, they, you know, we tagged them there and then they just went, went away. Um, and about 25% of those fish were only observed at those two arrays. And then again, somewhere around 26% were, were observed up and down the coast. So for these two groups, there's a similar proportion of fish that tended to move down the Michigan coast, but much different percentages that weren't observed or were only observed at those other arrays. So I'm going to do exactly what Chuck said you shouldn't do yesterday, which is go look at this fish. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. We're going to see a few examples of, the, of these fish that we did see moving. So this fish, you can see, this fish did spawn at the array in every year and uh, at Drummond Island. So in 2007, within the same month of spawning, it was down here near Saginaw Bay and then down here in December, uh, south of Saginaw Bay. The next year, 2012, we saw it down here as well. Now, well, 2010, actually, first we saw it in Saginaw Bay. And then in 2013, it was observed here. So this is an example of a fish repeating, this is a hatchery female, repeating these long distance movements right after spawning and being detected almost all the way, half, more than halfway down the lake. You know, this is, and the t this fish moved a total of uh, 1,345 kilometers in, in that time, at least. This is the minimum distance it moved in that time. And here is a wild female that once again spawned at the array in 2010 up here. By December 2010, it was again south of Saginaw Bay. And then we saw it up here in, in November, and, and, and then it was back in the spring, and then it was recaptured. So this fish was only at large for about six months, and it went almost 600 kilometers in that time, the minimum distance. Once again, once it got down here, we don't know what it did. It could have gone out in the lake and circled into Canada for all we know. This fish is a wild male. And it spawned in the array 2010, 2013. Two years in a row, we saw it down here with, like, within a month after spawning, it was the other, other end of the lake. And it's a total distance of 1,253 kilometers. But I mean, within the whole distance of the lake, like 320 odd kilometers. I mean, this fish moved that twice, two years in a row, within a month of spawning. And here's a fish that we saw. Okay, first of all, it started down here. In the, so this was, this did not spawn at the array. It's a hatchery male, it did not spawn at the array. We saw it move up, and up the coast here in April and May, all the way from just north of Saginaw Bay to the Straits almost, and then back down and back up again. And the next year it did the same thing. It started, where did it start? It started here, went up, all the way up here, back down, back up here again, and down here, and then it was recaptured in June, uh, right in the Canadian waters. So this is again a hatchery male that did not spawn at the array. So we're seeing that, so this is two years in a row this fish, this fish did this. And this one fish, I tried to put the arrows on the thing and I couldn't even do it. It's just, too, it moved too much. So I'm gonna show you a, a, a progression. This fish moved repeatedly up and down the coast. I'm gonna show you in table form though, because it's easier to see. So this is every year, this is, this is a time, every month down here. And this is a, the arrays ra arranged from north to south. So these are the Mackinac Line, Bois Blanc Island, St. Ignace, um, down through Hammond Bay, 40 Mile Point, Presque Isle, Thunder Bay, Sturgeon Point, Oscoda, and then down to Saginaw Bay. So this fish moved 
Every single year we see it in the spring here, moving around down the coast. And this year I'm going to show you in particular, it started in May and went all the way down from Bois Blanc Island to Saginaw Bay and then back all the way up to Bois Blanc Island here, west of Bois Blanc Island, and all the way back, halfway down and back up again. And this is one example of one year. And the other thing about this fish is it didn't spawn at the array. In every fall, we saw it right somewhere in between 40 Mile Point and Thunder Bay. So we think it's probably spawning in that area. But you can get an idea of the kind of movements it's making. That spring I showed you that year, it moved 523 kilometers in 30 days. And there's examples here where it moved 30 kilometers in five hours, 34 kilometers in six and a half hours, and 11 kilometers in an hour and 10 minutes. So this is, I mean, I, I think, I mean, we've seen a lot of evidence at this meeting, and there's a lot for walleye, and I think Tim Johnson showed salmon in Lake Ontario, and then we saw um, those coaster brook trout earlier today. And the general point is that these fish are moving much further than we thought they were, They're, and much quicker. I mean, and you know, this, the stuff we see in the spring here, my theory is it's sort of, it's related to uh, smelt probably staging off those rivers in the spring, the lake trout maybe moving up and down, feeding on different concentrations of smelt. So in summary, We've got a lot of stuff from this so far. This is just the low-hanging fruit, as it were. Uh, we've described a new spawning behavior. we described a new uh, spawning habitat for lake trout, which is drumlins. We, uh, we looked at a technique to identify spawning habitat by satellite imagery. We've determined that lake trout have very high site fidelity to spawning reefs in, in Lake Huron. And we've got evidence of these, these long-range movements that are repeated movements in the lake at a scale that I don't think I, well, I personally didn't anticipate. I don't know if anyone else did, but I don't think I did. There's a lot more to come. Uh, the whole purpose of this thing was to look at behavior within the array. We haven't even gotten into that yet. Tom Blinder is beginning to look at that stuff, but I mean, to look at the positional, this, none, none of this stuff I showed you uh, really looks at the actual positions that the array can, can give us. So that's a whole, another pile of, of work that can get done. Uh, we want to make more hatchery wild and male female comparisons. Uh, half, but half of these tags actually had depth tags on too, so we can tell exactly what depth the fish was at, not only where it was, but what depth it was at. So we haven't even begun to look at that data yet. And then we, have, we want to do some detailed analysis of the fish moving through those two big arrays that are near, near the, uh, the positional array. So that's it. I'll take questions.